Scott, welcome to Google. Thank you. Thank it's you for coming in. Perhaps, thank you. Uh, perhaps you could tell us what got you interested in space. Sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to say it's great to be here. It's uh, great to be anywhere with gravity. Because <laughs> now I can sit down. Can't do that in space. So on the space station, I changed positions so many times. You would have thought I was running for president. <laughs> Maybe I should have. So to those of you in the audience that do not appear to be space alien, aliens, I'd like to say good afternoon. And to the rest of you, I come in peace. <laughs> what I'd like to do first, before I talk about like, what got me interested in becoming an astronaut, I want to read from the book a little bit because uh, you can hear it in my own voice, and then you don't have to go out and buy the audio book. I know these are expensive. I'm going to start at the beginning of the story. About, it's only going to take about five minutes. I'm going to start at the beginning of the story, and uh, it's really sort of the end of the story. As I got home, and this is about 48 hours after I got back after being on the space station for an entire year. I'm sitting at the head of my dining room table at home in Houston, finishing dinner with my family, my longtime girlfriend, Amiko, now my fiance in the back of the room, my daughters, Samantha and Charlotte, my twin brother, Mark, his wife, Gabby, his daughter, Claudia, our father, Richie, and Amiko's son, Corbin. It's a simple thing, sitting at a table and eating a meal with those you love, and many people do it every day without giving it much thought. For me, it's something I've been dreaming of for almost a year. I contemplated what it would be like to eat this meal so many times, now that I'm finally here, it doesn't seem entirely real. The faces of the people I love that I haven't seen for so long, the chatter of many people talking together, the clink of silverware, the swish of wine in a glass, these are all unfamiliar. Even the, the sensation of gravity holding me in my chair feels strange. And every time I put a glass or fork down on the table, there's a part of my mind that is looking for a dot of Velcro or a strip of duct tape to hold it in place. I've been back on Earth for 48 hours. I push back from the table and struggle to stand up, feeling like an old man getting out of a recliner. Stick a fork in me. I'm done, I announce. Everyone laughs and encourages me to go get some rest, so I go to sleep. Then I wake up a few hours later with flu-like symptoms, not feeling very well at all. I struggle to get up, find the edge of the bed, feet down, sit up, stand up. At every stage, I feel like I'm fighting through quicksand. When I'm finally vertical, the pain in my legs is awful, and on top of that pain, I feel something even more alarming. All the blood in my body is rushing to my legs like the sensation of the blood rushing to your head when you do a headstand, but in reverse. I can feel the tissue in my legs swelling. I shuffle my way to the bathroom, moving my weight from one foot to the other with deliberate effort, left, right, left, right. I make it to the bathroom, flip on the light, and look down at my legs. They are swollen and alien stumps, not legs at all. There are no kids in here, right? No kids? No kids work at Google? Not yet? Oh shit, I say. Amiko, come look at this. She kneels down and squeezes one ankle, and it squishes like a water balloon. She looks up at me with worried eyes. I can't even feel your ankle bones, she says. It was about 400 pages after that. <laughs> but anyway, so how did I get interested in becoming yeah, an astronaut? What was the journey between I want to be in space and, and there? Yeah, so, you know, I was this... Uh, atypical kind of person, kid, that became an astronaut. Because when I was younger, I was a really bad student. I didn't do well, not something I'm proud of. I spent more time looking out the window, wondering what was going on outside, or looking at the clock, trying to will it to run faster, just so I could get out of the classroom, than I ever did paying attention in school. I managed to graduate from high school in the uh, bottom half of my class. And I went on to college because I was supposed to go to college, I thought. Um, I actually went to the wrong school. Now, I don't mean I went to this school thinking this one over here was a better fit for me. What I mean is I applied to and got accepted to and showed up here thinking I was going to this other school. <laughs> Quite possibly the only person that has ever done this. And I get to my college, and I'm there for a few days, and I'm like, 
hey, when's the uh, football game? And they're like, we don't have a football team. That's that other school in Maryland. And I was basically, you know, doing the same thing I did in high school. It was impossible for me to pay attention. I think if I was a kid today, I'd be the kid with ADD or ADHD, and maybe I would have gotten a little bit more help, because we know what that is. I couldn't study, wasn't doing well. Eventually, I'm really not even going to class. And one day, I just happened to be walking across the school campus, and I go into the bookstore, the college bookstore, to buy, like, gum or something. Not a book. Was not a big reader. I walk into the bookstore, and I happen to see this book on the end of the shelf. It's got this red, white, and blue cover. It's got a really cool title. Made me pick it up, not this book. Made me pick it up, looked at the back, interested enough in what the back said that I looked through it, took my gum money, purchased the book, went back and laid on my unmade dorm room bed for the next three days and read the stories of the fighter pilots that became the test pilots that became the original Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts. The book was The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe. I think a, a combination between, you know, what these guys were doing and how Tom wrote in this creative nonfiction way just captured my imagination. And I felt like I had a lot in common with those guys, the early astronauts and test pilots that became astronauts, uh, with one exception. And that is, I was a bad student, I couldn't pay attention. And I thought, you know, if I could fix that one thing, solve that one thing, maybe I could be like them. Maybe I could go and fly airplanes in the Navy, land on an aircraft carrier. Maybe if I did well at that, I could become a test pilot, later, possibly an astronaut. And I know what you're thinking, you know, 18-year-old kid, reads a book, decides he's gonna become an astronaut. You know, that's kind of science fiction. It's, uh, you know, it's a giant leap. Really what it was, was, you know, it started with something very, very challenging, very hard, which was to teach myself how to pay attention and study. But once I figured that out, it really became a bun bunch of very, you know, smaller, manageable steps, always with, you know, opportunities to fail, but always somehow managing my way back on course. And if you consider the, that I read that book at 18, uh, fast forward 18 years later, I was 36, I was flying in space for the very first time as the first American astronaut in my class of 35 people to fly. That's a pretty remarkable comeback that for me is even hard to believe. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's, that's very, very cool. Um, not, I, the whole book is absolutely fascinating. I, I wondered um, if you could talk about, well, certainly I learned a lot about the International Space Station itself and you spent a, mm -hmm. a long time up there, yeah. a year a year the last in. What's it like living on the ISS? Well, it's, uh, it, it, there's a few things about it that uh, come to mind, right? It's uh, fun, for one. You know, you're floating, which uh, after you getting over the novelty of it being fun, it uh, makes most things harder to do. You know, there's a few things easier. You always say there's two things easier to do in zero gravity, moving heavy, heavy objects and um, you know, getting in awkward positions like to hook up the coax cable on your TV. <laughs> Much easier when you can turn upside down or sideways. <laughs> Actually, I said this to a kid last night and he pointed out a third thing. And he said, acrobatics is also easier. <laughs> Absolutely right. Everything is harder um, because you can't put anything down. You know, you'll lose it. Even brushing your teeth is hard. You know, you have the toothpaste, the toothbrush, maybe a cap on the tooth, toothpaste, and then you have nothing to do with the toothpaste after you brush your teeth because there's no sink. You can either spit it out into a tissue, which is uncomfortable in zero gravity, or you can swallow it. And people, half the people do one thing. I swallowed my toothpaste for a whole year, which I don't recommend. <laughs> um, you also have an incredible view on the space station, but it's a hard place to live and work. When you, maybe it wouldn't be hard for you guys because you guys spend a lot of time at work, um, but they make it really nice that you want to spend time at work. Um, but when you go to sleep, you're at work. When you wake up, you're at work. Uh, you can't go outside. No sun, no wind, no rain, no freedom of choice to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Um, challenging because you're living in this very risky environment. You always have to be ready for an emergency, even when you're asleep. Um, but it's also this magical place. 
It's like living in Disney World. The space station is very big, um, a million pounds, size of a football pitch, a uh, internal volume of a really big house, so you never feel like closed in. Yeah. Um, but it's a uh, it's a privilege to have spent for me 500 days of my life there. And the last time you went, that that year long study <laughs> was uh, designed to find out how people cope in space. Like, so if we were to go to Mars, how would how would humans cope? And um, you know what what were the the lessons that you you brought back from that? What was the science that we actually found? So. This year-long mission, the idea behind it, you know, many of you might be aware, we generally send astronauts up there for about six months. It's usually like four to five and a half is how the schedule works. But um, NASA started talking about sending an astronaut and a cosmonaut to the space station for a year with the idea of, you know, someday we're going to go to Mars. To get to Mars, it's going to take uh, 200 days to get there. You'll have to spend a year on the surface. So, you know, you're not in zero gravity, but essentially you're still kind of in space. You know, Mar Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. It's got a third of the gravity of Earth, a lot of radiation. It's going to take you 200 days to get home. And there are things that happen to us in space, um, to our physiology, that we need to understand more about bone loss, muscle loss, effects on our vision, effects on our immune system, the radiation effects on us at a genetic level. So we wanted to study this for a longer period of time and study it while we have the space station, which is an incredible facility to do science before we lose that in the next, I don't know, six or so years. Um, so the idea behind this year-long mission is to someday go to Mars. And there was also a, a side component. So it was me, excuse me, me and this cosmonaut up on the space station for a year. There's also the side study with my brother and I because he's an identical twin. NASA has had data on him since 1995. He's familiar with how things work. He spent some time in space um, as well. Uh, he flew four times. He spent 50 days in space. So I would say 50 compared to my 500. <laughs> Every chance I show that to my 50. <laughs> not, not there's competition. No, no competition at all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the idea behind this genetic study with my brother and I is to see how the space environment, the radiation, the stress, the microgravity, perhaps, affects us genetically. And they have found some interesting mm -hmm. results so far. Right. And that's a lo quite longitudinal study, I assume, they'll, they'll... Yes, it'll go on for the rest of my life. And, uh, you know, the way NASA science works is, uh, you know, it's not driven by like investments and schedules and trying to get results out because you're in competition with somebody else. So it generally takes a few years. So generally, from the time you collect the data, it's like three to five years to a, a result. Okay, great. So um, you want to get to the ISS, of course. So talk us through the process of finding out that you're going to be on a mission through to actually you know, mm -hmm. arriving uh, either the Suez or there's obviously a lot of training, yeah. years of training that build up to, to that. Yeah, so I became an astronaut in 1996 after, you know, spending time in the Navy as a fighter pilot, uh, flying the F-14 Tomcat, um, and then as a test pilot in the Navy, and then I went on to NASA. And then for the next few years, I, you basically get a PhD in the space shuttle because it's the most complicated aerospace vehicle ever built. 2,000 switches and circuit breakers inside, you know, some of which if you throw a switch or push a button at the wrong time, you blow the thing up you or your crew members along with you and uh, yeah so I spent most of my time over the next you know three and a half years just you know for this kid that probably had ADD you know learning how to fly this most complicated thing was a challenge and I worked really hard at it happened to get assigned to my first flight not in a traditional way you would think you would come into a large room and somebody would announce that uh, hey you've been assigned to this mission congratulations the way I found out is the commander of the upcoming mission I was going to be on, this Hubble Space Telescope Repair Mission, had me, he said, hey, come in this office, I need to talk to you. And I'd never really talked to this guy before. He was this space shuttle commander, kind of a, you know, had a little bit of a reputation. Um, and he pokes me in the chest and he goes, you better have your shit together because we're flying in space in six months. <laughs> said, like, Yes, sir. I'll get my I'll get my shit together right away. Um, and we trained for. We wound up flying nine months later because of, of some del delays. But 
you know, pretty soon you're, you've kind of made terms with your situation. You know, you consider the risk. About, uh, you know, after this last accident we had, you, you have a one in 70 chance of dying on this flight. It's kind of like if I took a deck of cards and, you know, left the jokers and all the extra cards in it. I threw it out in the audience, a couple decks of cards. Everyone that got the ace of spades didn't go home tonight. You know, that's how risky it is. Demonstrated risk. And uh, so you think about that leading up to the, your first mission and even subsequent missions. Every flight I always wrote letters to my family. I would give them to my brother and then when I came back he would throw them in the garbage. The idea was if I didn't come back he would hand them out and I did the same thing for him when he flew. And pretty soon you're heading up to the launch pad on your first flight. Mine was on the Space Shuttle Discovery and the launch pad is completely abandoned. Because uh, the shuttle is a giant bomb on the top of this hill, fully fueled 5 million pounds of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, two solid rocket motors. Uh, place is abandoned, it, with, it, with the exception of you and your six crewmates and a few people that are going to help you get strapped in. You get in the space shuttle about uh, three and a half hours prior to launch. You get strapped in tight, you're lying on your back in your orange pressure suit. The uh, guys and girls that get you strapped in, they, take, they bolt the hatch closed and take off. You get about five miles away. Clock starts counting down towards zero. And uh, you're getting all these systems ready for launch. The auxiliary power unit that powers the hydraulics, the electrical system, all the different engines, the main engines that you use for liftoff. The environmental control system, which is the life support system, the computers, they all have to be perfect. Clock gets to nine minutes and it stops. That's to give you time to catch up if you happen to be behind on what you're doing. It's also the time you think, man, this is really stupid. <laughs> Flying into space for the first time. It's not something you really expect to ever think you'd do, for real. Uh, at least for me, this kid that couldn't do his homework. Uh, and then the, but you can't get away, right? You're strapped in and <laughs> hatch is bolted closed. Plus, you wouldn't want to be the first astronaut ever running away from the <laughs> rocket. That wouldn't look good on the CV. No, it'd be a bad thing. Yeah, that would not be good on your resume. <laughs> Ran away from space launch. <laughs> first ever. Um, clock picks up, gets to a minute and 30 seconds. At 30 seconds, the space shuttle computers take over the launch. Um, six seconds, the main engines light, a million pounds of thrust. But you don't go anywhere. You're bolted to the launch pad by these eight giant bolts. The clock goes five, four, three, two, one. Those bolts are exploded open. Simultaneously, the solid rocket motors are lit. And it feels like the hand of God has just picked, picked you up off the launch pad and is throwing you out into outer space. You feel every pound of that seven million pounds of thrust. And I know if you've watched the shuttle launch on TV or been there in person, it looks like it's like lifting off slowly. When you're inside, there is nothing slow about this. <laughs> you get the feeling you're going somewhere. You're not sure where you're going, but you know you're not coming back to Florida. <laughs> and after eight and a half minutes, you're flying around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, floating around the Earth in zero G. Now, to contrast this with the shuttle launch, you know, or the Soyuz launch, the shuttle and the Soyuz, I flew twice on the shuttle and then twice on the Russian Soyuz. And the, the shuttle was disbanded in? Uh, 2011 was the last flight. So the only way for a manned launch to the ISS is now the Soyuz? Yeah, so now our access to space for China has the ability to launch people. They don't do it very often. But you know the access to space for the rest of the world with people is through Russia. And the Soyuz and the shuttle are similar in that, you know, they both launch people into space, and that's where the similarity <laughs> stops. My first Soyuz launch was in uh, 2010, and then I flew my last Soyuz launch. I launched in March of 2015 for this year in space mission, landed um, a year later, practically. And just to contrast, I'll tell you a little bit about the Soyuz launch. Soyuz is smaller than the shuttle, also, you know, a bomb on the top of a hill, fully fueled with uh, liquid oxygen and liquid kerosene is the fuel they use instead of hydrogen. And uh, you get in a similar, you get in a bus and head up to the launch pad with your crewmates. Soyuz is a bomb on the launch pad on the top of this hill, 
just like the shuttle. But you get up there and the place is not abandoned. There's like a hundred people up there milling around the base of this fully fueled rocket. All this vapor coming off the thing. And the Russians, you know, and I, I, I tell a few joke, jokes about the Russians, but I have a lot of respect for the cosmonauts and the people I've worked in the space program with. You know, just different cultures look at things different ways. And, you know, what's very important to a Russian is if your friends are going on a long trip, you're going to be there to say goodbye even if it's at the base of a fully fueled <laughs> rocket. So there are a hundred people up there and you're just trying to get through them to get to the launch pad. Some of them are smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Swear to God, you're like, that guy's smoking. So you want to get in that rocket as fast as you can because there's an emergency escape system up on top. They actually had a rocket blow up on the launch pad and killed like over a hundred people. And they still allow smoking up there. Um, so you get in and it's, it's cramped, it's loud, it's hot, your visor's fogging up. You're all strapped in tight a few hours before launch. There's no countdown clock in the Soyuz. They didn't seem to need to put a countdown clock in there. This was going to be one of the rockets that like launched nuclear missiles during the Cold War. After a while, you're like, hey, what time are we leaving? <laughs> it's like 10.10, 10, right? Is that Moscow time or Baikonur time? Eventually, someone comes up on the radio and says, ignition. <laughs> <laughs> and I could just picture that guy smoking, just running out there with his, with his light. Yeah, asking the same question, what time yeah, did we launch? Yeah. And then, you know, you do lift off slowly in the Soyuz because there's no solid rocket motors. But still, within nine minutes, you're flying around the Earth at 25 times the speed of sound. I quite liked you talked about the uh, rituals uh, as you as you launch, and mm -hmm. the Russians have so many. It seemed to be that well, it worked the first time, and no one's dead. Yeah. So let's keep doing. Let's perhaps you could talk to a couple of yeah. the stranger ones. You know, yeah, the Russians are a little bit more superstitious than Americans, I think, by culture. But we also have uh, superstitions in the U.S. space program. As an example, after you get suited up in your orange spacesuit, you um, you play a, a round of you play a card game, low ball poker. It's got a specific name. I forget the name of it. I think I may have mentioned it in the book. But um, the commander of the mission has to lose, or you can't leave the building. <laughs> and if he is doing really well, it's, people start to get nervous because you're looking at this <laughs> clock, and you have to be walking out at a certain time because you have this schedule to keep. And if the guy starts, keeps winning, you know, eventually what you do is you kick people out of the game until eventually it's just like one-on-one. -on -one. But I've seen people just keep winning. And, it, and that's, so, that's so his bad luck. His it, bad his, luck is used there. up. Yeah. yeah, he has to lose, so he loses, he uses up his bad luck before you go to the launch pad. And then... They do know that you're also on the launch pad, right? So you, your bad luck just doesn't matter. Oh, but yeah, the commander represents okay, the whole okay, crew. Right. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just about him. I don't think it really matters if he wins or loses, to be honest with you, but it's tradition. Um, in the Russian space program, it's also traditions. We always watch the same movie, The White Son of a Desert or something. It's a comedy because they had an accident in the Soyuz. The next crew watched that movie, and they never had another accident. So they'll be watching that movie <laughs> all the way until they have another accident. Hopefully not. We also stopped the bus on the way to the launch pad in the same exact spot. Yuri Gagarin stopped the bus because he had to pee. <laughs> so we get out of the bus, we undo our pressure suit that's just been pressure checked, extensively pressure checked. <laughs> we break the seal and we pee on the bus tire in the same spot Yuri Gagarin peed. And the female astronauts bring a small bottle with them as well. Yeah, they so bring a bottle. I've heard they spray their water or in some cases urine. If they're really superstitious, they brought some of their own urine with them so they don't have to completely get out of the suit. You know, it's funny, though. People are like, wow, you do that pressure check? You spend all that time to make sure the suit, suit works and is sealed, and then you just go undo the whole thing and get into the so Soyuz? They say, I can't believe the Russians do that. And I go, we do the same thing in the U.S. We just have a bathroom on the launch pad, <laughs> the last toilet on Earth, and if you're leaving Earth, you're, gonna, you're damn well going to use that last toilet. So you do the same thing. You get out of your suit, you pee, you put it all back on, get in the shuttle and go. That's great. I mean, launch. That's, launch. Launch. That's great. <laughs> um, what, uh, 
I'm sort of interested with your year in space. How did you cope with the isolation? There's a period in the book where you talk about you were the only person in the US section. Yeah. I mean, it started, did it start off as a few, I've got the air to myself, a bit more space? Is, is, is isolation training something that you get taught? No, it's not something they, they, they teach you. They, def they definitely make sure you're not like claustrophobic. When you do the astronaut selection, they'll actually you know, hook you up with a heart monitor, put you in a small rubber bag, thick rubber bag, zip it up, and push you into a dark closet and leave you there, not telling you how long you're going to be in it. And uh, there's no way you could fake uh, not being claustrophobic in that environment. But they do check that. You know, I was- You had a nap, you say. Yeah, yeah I yeah, fell yeah. asleep. That's right. <laughs> smart, smart. Yeah. But, I was fortunate in that I flew for six months before I flew for a year, which is good training for a year in space because I knew, knew what I was getting into. I actually like being on the U.S. side of the space station by myself. Um, not that I don't like the people I'm there with, but it's just easier in a lot of ways. It's very quiet. It's peaceful when you put something somewhere. You know it's going to be there when you come back. You can have it very orderly. Um, so actually on this last flight, I was alone basically on the U.S. side of the space station for about six weeks. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I liked it. Um, and uh, But to answer your full question, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. how do you deal with the isolation? You have good connectivity with Earth. I mean, you can make phone calls, you have email, you have video conferencing capability. I mean, people are amazed at the, uh, the ability we have to communicate uh, with the ground, which I find fascinating that people are shocked. You can have email in space? I'm like, yeah, you know, satellite communication? <laughs> the satellite? Satellite, I mean. And, and with the internet, I guess social media plays an increasing part in an astronaut, yeah. that public perception thing. Did you use social media? The, the on Yeah, I did. You know, um, before I launched, President Obama invited me to the State of the Union address. And he, he uh, during the address, he challenged me to Instagram the experience. So, of course, I tried to do that as best I could. I actually thought, felt like, you know, engaging with the public with, uh, you know, social media was kind of a responsibility. You know, the public pays for this program and to keep them involved is important. It was also good for Amico and I and our relationship for us to have something that was kind of like a personal project to do that had, you know, daily feedback in how well you were doing at it with likes. Because Amika worked in PR for NASA. Yeah, she worked at the NASA Public Affairs, although they, they made her do this as a, you know, outside of her work hours, which is hard to believe that <laughs> that was the case. But yeah, so I tried to engage the public. I often would have, in my free time, do some like tweet chats and things. One day, actually, I'm answering questions on a Saturday on Twitter, and President Obama, um, asks a question. He says, hey, Scott, do you ever look out the window and just freak out? <laughs> and I'm like, no, Mr. President, I don't really freak out about anything except getting a uh, Twitter question from you. <laughs> <laughs> Within seconds, Buzz Aldrin jumps into the conversation and he says, Mr. President, he's only in low Earth orbit. <laughs> I went. I went all the way to the moon. So I got trolled <laughs> while I was in space by the second man on the moon. It's like the greatest thing that's ever happened in my entire life. Um, what's your next big challenge? I'm interested. Sort of, you've, you've, you're not going back into space, presumably. That's that part of your life is finished now. Uh, you're still heavily involved in NASA, though. You're on the um, board to decide who's the next program? I call my next big challenge tomorrow. Okay. The Abbots has been going one day after another, especially writing this book. We've been on this book tour since October 16th with one day off on the weekends. Um, you know, it's challenging coming back after a year in space. You don't feel well. It's hard to adjust back to life without this very stringent schedule. I went from being a government employee for nearly 30 years to basically a, an employee, like a, uh, I forget, I don't even know what the right term is, a 
small business owner okay. with, you know. Free, freelance. Yeah, like a consultant and had to establish like very quickly two like kind of high-end keynote speeches. I wrote this book which took like 18 months. I wrote a kid's book, did the audio book, signed 27,000 tip-ins for this thing. I mean, all these things, it's just been one after another after another. So at, come January, I'll start, start to think, you know, harder about, like, what do I really want to do okay. for the next, you know, five to ten years. Yeah. Well, um, I'd love to take some questions. Maybe I'll audience. work for Google. There you go. We, we, I'm sure we would love to have you. <laughs> uh, so have a think about some questions, and we'll pass the mic around. Mm -hmm. I've got one more. Uh, you talking hey, about... Speaking, let me, let me yeah, yeah, no, go on. Just, just, yeah, yeah, just yeah. made me think of this. So speaking of Google, so I'm in Russia, and... Um, the head of the NASA office in Star City, and my, I was like the lead NASA guy there, and the guy who was like the safety engineer, he says to me one day, he goes, hey, I want to show you something. He opens up his computer, and he says, see this? And there's a little rectangular window, and it's a Google underneath. He said, see this? You should invest all your money in this right now <laughs> and I'm looking at it and I'm like nah I don't get it <laughs> <laughs> how wrong yeah, I was yeah fair <laughs> um, I you talk about uh, being in the astronaut office and being surrounded by these great astronauts of history uh, of which one was Senator Glenn yeah. um, have you ever thought about going to politics is that, is that, a, is that a, something you'd be interested in you know I think I would have a lot to contribute. The problem I have is, um, well, there are a few problems. One is that I'm neither a Democrat nor a Republican. You know, in the U.S., I'm, an, I'm not a registered independent, but I voted for Republicans, I voted for Democrats, I'm kind of in the middle. On some issues, I look like a Republican, on others, I look like a Democrat. But the bigger problem is in the United States, and I, you guys might not even understand this because this is a uniquely uh, U.S., perhaps a uniquely U.S. thing, but we have two things that prevent moderates from uh, winning elections. Uh, one is called gerrymandering. And gerrymandering is when you create a political district that includes all the people of one party. And you, what you do is if you're that party, you sue the government to say, I'm going to take this swath and it's going to be mostly Democrats or mostly Republicans. And the people in the United States that run in the primaries are the hardcore people in the party. They're the extreme right or the extreme left. And if you're running in one of these gerrymandered districts, if you're a Democrat and you're running in a de gerrymandered Democrat district, you have to be on the left side of the party, the extreme left, likewise the extreme right for a Republican. So you can't even get on the ticket unless you're an extremist. And the key, you either have to be an extremist or you have to be a very clever liar. You know, you have to make believe you're on the extreme and then somehow pivot to the center. Very, very hard to do. So it doesn't make uh, uh, the situation, um, you know, acceptable for, or, or workable for people that are moderates. Um, we have an independent party in the United States, but it's not one that's ever been very successful because of things like this thing called Citizens United. You know, Citizens United was a lawsuit, but it allows corporations to give unlimited amounts of money to political action committees that support candidates. So basically, you know, you become beholden to these donors that are giving you tons of money. And if you don't want to um, be somebody's, you know, working for some corporation when you're really supposed to be representing the people, it's hard to win. But you did vote from space. I voted, yeah. Yeah, was that quite an easy process? Yeah, yeah. pretty easy. I didn't have to wait in line. Pop the ballot, yeah, <laughs> that's good. Um, questions, there must be good questions. Yeah, there's a microphone on your left. Hi, thank you so much for coming to visit us. Really appreciate that. Um, question about the Hubble telescope. Uh, how was it? Uh, how was it to work on? What's it like? <laughs> so yeah, my first flight was to Hubble, and it's uh, it's really big. It's like the size of a uh, school bus, maybe bigger. One side of it that you rarely see is uh, I don't know why you rarely see this side, but the one side always faces the sun. It's kind of like burnt 
like burnt to a crisp almost. And um, but it's amazing to see a uh, an instrument that's been out in space for so long that has shown us more about at least the general public more about the universe um, than anything else ever. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, working on it. I didn't I didn't do any of the spacewalks because I was the pilot of the mission. We actually launched right before Y2K on this flight in December. And NASA uh, had us land early because they were worried that the computers on the space shuttle were going to divide by zero. Mm -hmm. And we were going to go through some wormhole, <laughs> <laughs> end up on the other side of the galaxy. We'll have to wait another 1,000 years to see if that would have happened. But. You, um, you did get to see the outside of the space station quite a lot. And was that, you, you discussed how, you talked about how that was kind of, um, you could see the tiny asteroid or pop up. Yeah, you had the opportunity on this flight to do th uh, three spacewalks. I'd never, never done a spacewalk before because as the pilot or commander of the space shuttle, you just don't do them because it's risky and you're uh, critical to landing the uh, spacecraft safely. The mission specialists are more expendable. <laughs> um, but yeah, going outside for the first time is pretty pretty crazy. Um, neither of us had done a spacewalk before, so I was the more experienced guy. So I got to go out first and open the hatch, and you open the hatch, and Earth is 250 miles below you, and you're going 17,500 miles an hour, and you're making sure you're. For one, it's hard to get out because the suit and the hole that is the hatch are like almost the exact same size. So, and it's square. The suit's kind of square, but the hatch is round. It's like putting a, round, a square peg in a round hole. It has to be perfect to get out. And it feels like, at first, you're kind of climbing down with your head down towards the earth, although you know you don't have gravity, so you don't physically feel like you're upside down, but visually you feel like you're upside down. It was interesting when I got halfway out, all of a sudden my orientation, my reference frame shifted so now all of a sudden I felt like I was climbing out of the sunroof of a car and there was this alien planet over my head like in a uh, science fiction movie like right there and I felt like I was on earth and there was this alien planet and it looked like it was just going to come crashing down upon me. Wow. But I had to really focus so I didn't like lose anything or very distracting that kind of situation. I think you talk about if you lost focus and uh, were no longer tethered to the ISS you that's you're done for and if you are a mile or an inch away yeah it's, it's well you know in the u.s suit we do have a, a jet pack that has a little bit of fuel that you could potentially fly yourself back if you became detached um it's challenging to use often when you're practicing this in a vr situation you don't miss you, you miss the station altogether and in those cases you know if you're an inch away and you can't reach you might as well be a mile away the results are still the same. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Who's got the microphone? Yeah. Um, so I'm interested um, oh. to hear what the experiences were like once you returned to Earth after you're in space, and was it harder to kind of readjust from a mental or a physical perspective? Yeah. So there's, you know, there's, I think, two general adjustments. There's the physical and the psychological part. Physically, you know, at first you're, you're nauseous, although, you know, I didn't throw up this time. I threw up after six months. Surprisingly, I didn't throw up after a year. I wish I could have, but I couldn't. I would have felt a lot better if I could have just puked my guts up. I don't know if, if some of you ever saw pictures of me coming out of the, out of the Soyuz. I don't know if there's one. I'll, I'll, I'll find one. Yeah. But I, anyway, I had this, you get, it's interesting, the UK book has different pictures, but I had this big... Um, big smile on my face when I got when I landed and it was not because I was feeling well because I wasn't I was just trying to look better than the two guys I was with <laughs> I was actually hoping to get an Academy Award <laughs> but I understand they sometimes make mistakes so maybe next time I fly in space for a year you talked about that they carried you to chairs for the Russian doctors but yeah, you, they, wanted, you wanted to walk you could out. walk if you had to you wouldn't walk well the first time I started walking, I make a comment. There's actually this PBS special that just came out, and they actually show the video of me in the tent doing some post-flight tests right after I got back, and I say something like, you know, I'm walking, and I'm like, going like this. I'm like, I'm walking like Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> Felt like Jar Jar Binks. But you, 
for the first few days, you're sore, your joints, your muscles are stiff. I had, uh, I was nauseous for a week. Anywhere my skin touched anything, I had rashes and hives for a couple of weeks. Uh, like I said, in, when I was reading, when I stand, stood up, my legs would swell. I could actually see them swelling. No kidding, just like this. Feeling all the blood just infusing in the bottom of my legs. It was like, and this is not good. <laughs> um, and how long did that take to get over? I would say the physical stuff, completely a couple of months. Okay. The mental part of it, probably more like eight months. Wow. Because you live in this very controlled environment where you have a schedule that you are following you know, every five minutes. Now, sometimes the blocks of time that are dedicated to your activity are 10 hours if it's a spacewalk. Other times, if it's throw this switch, it's five minutes. But you are following that every, all the time for a year. And then when you get home, you don't have that anymore. And I, both times after my long flights, I would find myself just sitting on the couch with all this stuff to do, but because no one was telling me when to do it or what I had to do, I just sat there. And it took a while to readapt to living on Earth. There are actually some good physical things about being in space for a long time, and that is when you, uh, when you don't use your feet, all the calluses, they fall off. It takes a few months. It's kind of disgusting when you take your socks off and you get this <laughs> big <laughs> cloud of foot dandruff. You never want to take your socks off in the vicinity of one of your crewmates. But then when you get, you know, after a few months, you have these baby feet. And I, after my first long flight, when no one knew who I was and that I was up there, like two days after I got home, I went to get a massage, one of these commercial massage places. You know, at the end of the massage, they rub your feet. The ladies rub my feet, and she says, you have the softest feet I have ever felt <laughs> in my entire life. All I said to her was, thank you. <laughs> I'm very proud of them. <laughs> then I left. He's probably still, still talking about that bald guy with the soft feet. Uh, let's take a question over here. Uh, you have a new, unique experience uh, working with Russians, and uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, how would you like to see the, fu da, hmm? the future of uh, collaborations with Russia in a uh, meant flight? Yeah. Yeah, I think our, our space cooperation with Russia is, is a, a great example of how two countries that at times were enemies, sometimes not friends, often conflict, but how we can work together in this international program for something that we both believe in, feel strongly about, and do it as a team. And in space, uh, even on the ground, working, preparing for spaceflight, any kind of conflict that we ever had, our governments ever had, does not affect our working relationship. You know, we are friends, we are colleagues. What is more important to us is supporting one another, our personal safety. You know, we have to rely on each other sometimes for our lives. That any issues between our countries, we never really even discuss much. Sometimes you do. Like, when I was on the space station, it's when Russia moved into Syria, and there was real concern that pretty soon, um, due to some kind of accident, you know, the U.S. and the Russian military would ha get into some kind of skirmishes. Fortunately, that never happened. We talked about that on the space station, but it almost, we were talking about it kind of in an abstract way, like we were talking about not the United States and Russia, but like China and Germany. Um, and then we just realized, hey, this is on Earth, and we are in space, and um, that those issues don't really uh, translate up here. Misha Kornienko, Mikhail Kornienko, my uh, Russian brother from another mother that I spent a year in space with, he, he would say a few times during the year, he says, you know, if our countries ever want to solve their, the issues we have with one another, all we need to do is put our two presidents in space for a year <laughs> together. <laughs> Although those two guys might like it too much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's, take one, let's take one from the back. Hello. Uh, very nice work. Congratulations. So when we are computer science, right? So whenever we watch a movie and there's a computer guy doing stuff, 
we look at that and say, yeah, that's never going to happen. That's not like that. How do you feel when you watch films like Interstellar and Martian, The Martian, Gravity, all these kind of movies from space that we, from our point of view, oh, that looks amazing, might be like that. How do you feel about it? Well, I watched all of those movies in space. You, I think you mentioned maybe, Gravity in the yeah, book. Maybe not Interstellar, but I definitely watched The Martian and Gravity in space. I actually, they sent us The Martian a couple days before it, uh, it came out. We watched it like a preview. I actually talk, talked to Matt Damon on the phone a couple days before it came out. He was interested in what we were doing. It seems like he knew about as much, he knew as much about space as maybe George Clooney does. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, The Martian was pretty accurate, I think. You know, there was things, there are always things that are wrong with these movies, like, you know, that storm they had on Mars, there's like no atmosphere on Mars. You wouldn't have some like 800 mile an hour. You might have an 800 mile an hour wind, but it's not going to knock anything over, you know, because there's no air. Um, the other thing that was weird with the Martian is they always called the, the commander, the female commander on the rescue ship, they would call her commander. We're on a first name basis. <laughs> then gravity, you know, gravity's got all kinds of technical problems with it, but it's exciting movie. Um, I think it's good that they took that license to make it really dramatic. We watched it on the space station. We had this screen set up in the uh, node one of the space station, which the U.S. laboratory module is in the back. And um, it's kind of like watching a movie of your house burning down <laughs> while, you're, while, you're, yeah. while you're inside of it. <laughs> but there's the biggest regret of my whole year in space was we're watching that movie and Sandra Bullock in this scene with her short dark hair is floating through the lab module in her underwear. And Samantha Christopher Eddy, this Italian astronaut woman, she, with her short dark hair, comes floating by in her like spandex, like gym shorts she ran in and a t-shirt looking exactly like her. And I'm thinking, I gotta get a picture of this. And then I didn't because I felt like weird about it. Because, <laughs> you know, she was in her gym clothes and Sandra Bullock was in her underwear, but it would have been the, it would have been the, the biggest tweet ever from space. <laughs> You actually, I think you talk about... Um, yeah, I talk about that in the book. And you were compared with Mark Watney unfavorably when you, you let some flowers... Yeah. Well, you didn't let the flowers, the system let some flowers. I was just, yeah, I was, yeah. I was just following NASA's rules on taking care of... We, we grew some vegetables, uh, lettuce in space, then we grew some zinnias, flowers, which apparently you can eat, but you, you don't eat them. The idea being if you can, you know, grow a flower, you can grow maybe something like a tomato. And I was growing these flowers and... Just following the directions, water them, don't water them, water them. There was so much time delay in the NASA system of looking at the photos about the condition of the flowers. When they would tell me to water them, they would be almost dead. <laughs> when they would tell me to stop watering them, they would be covered, they would be wet and covered in mold. Um, and I was fine with that because it it's not my experiment. I was just doing what I was told. And then one day I, I post a picture of the flowers and some guy comes up and he says, you are no Mark Watney. <laughs> Fight was on then, right? And then I told NASA, I said, okay, if you want these flowers to live, you're going to have to just let me decide when to water them because there's too much time delay in the system. So I started like touching them and brought them back to life and got them really nice. Occasionally I'd take them down to the Russian segment and put them on the duct tape on their table as a little centerpiece when we were having dinner. And they got a lot of attention and people liked the, the flowers. One day, Sergei Volkov, Russian guy, he says to me, he goes, Scott, why are you growing these flowers? <laughs> and I say, I say, Sergei, we're growing these so we can grow these flowers. Maybe we can grow something that's more nutritious um, that we can eat to supplement our nutrition on the space station, especially if we're going to Mars. And go, the plan is, you know, we grow these flowers, then we can grow tomatoes that we can eat. He goes, why would you want to grow tomatoes? Goes, so we can eat them. He goes, you should grow potatoes. 
<laughs> goes, you can live on potatoes, you can't live on tomatoes, and you can make vodka. <laughs> this is a great guy. Uh, right, one more question. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your talk, very inspiring. Mm. Uh, can you share some thoughts about the potential of building a colony on Mars? The necessity, feasibility, and maybe even timeline? Hmm. What about you know, the journey to Mars and yeah. then a colony to Mars? You know, I was asked a question when I was on the, on the uh, space station by a reporter. And the question was, now that NASA has determined that there is liquid water on Mars sometime during the year, will that help us get there any sooner? And I said, I don't know, maybe. Now if we found money on Mars, <laughs> that would help us get there real quick. Because that's what we need is money, right? My brother often says, you know, going to Mars is not about rocket science. It's about the political science. You know, I think we know a lot of what we need to know to get the crew, a crew to Mars, to support them on the surface. It's just going to be really expensive. And to do that, you need, you know, representatives in government that are, that are science-minded people, that believe in science. Um, we don't have enough of that in the United States. So um, I think uh, us getting to Mars is doable. I think it's doable today, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, because at least in the U.S. government, I mean, my concern is less about going to Mars than it is about members of Congress not believing that 97% of the experts, scientists, um, are correct when they say we are responsible for, in some ways, responsible for climate change. That's a bigger concern of mine. You know, when you have people that are not, uh, don't come from a technical background and can say, I disagree with all these experts, I mean, that's, that's arrogance to an amazing degree that we have to get past that before we can do anything like going to Mars someday. Do you think that, so I have one more question on um, commercial space travel. So with mm -hmm. um, Virgin Galactic and SpaceX, the space tourism seems to be inching ever closer. Do you think that we'll ever reduce the risk enough that that will happen? You talk about the one in 70 odds. You know, do you think that's where the risk lies? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. I think we are on a cusp of, of uh, you know, technological advances that, uh, you know, it, whether it's in space flight or self driving vehicles, self-piloted cars. I think, you know, we're kind of getting into a revolution. You know, certainly with space flight, you know, it's going to be risky. People will die, just like in the early days of aviation. But, you know, hopefully within our lifetimes, you're going to be able to, you know, hop on a, a rocket-powered airplane or whatever you want to call it and be uh, in New York in 30 minutes, which would, would be really would cool. You, would you be first, first in line for that? Uh, it depends on how much they paid me. Okay. <laughs> Fair yeah. Um, all right, let's take one more question. One time. more question, and I want to just leave yeah. you with a final thought. Great. Man at the back. Thank you. Um, so my question is, like, thinking about your entire career from first day at school to first time flying on your own, first time in space, doing a spacewalk, like, what was the biggest jump in scariness? And did the previous jumps help you with that? Definitely. Entire career. Yeah, definitely building block. I, you know, I would say the scariest thing I've ever done is landing on an aircraft carrier at night. You know, half the time it's terrifying. The other half is just scary. Um, the most, like, holy shit moment, though, would be the first time you fly in space in those solid rocket motors light, and you feel every pound of that 7 million pound of thrust. And that's more than a holy shit moment. That's like a holy something else moment where it, it is so shocking that and so surprising and so unexpected that when I I flew my first flight like three years before my brother ever flew into space so I had three years to explain to him what that was going to be like and he was a combat pilot flew the A6 in the Gulf War test pilot same astronaut class basically you know same DNA as me <laughs> I tried to explain that to him. When he landed and the hatch opened and he came out of the shuttle, the first thing he said to me, I was waiting right there, he said, I had no idea what that was going to be like. <laughs> None. I mean, that is how amazing, absolutely amazing it is. 
Thank you. So before we leave, yeah, final thought. I'd just like to leave you all with uh, you know one final thought on my uh, my experience in in space, and that is, you know, when I was leaving the space station, this is a space station I spent 500 days of my life on over three flights. I flew my first flight to Hubble. It was a week. Second flight was two weeks. Third flight, 159 days. Fourth flight was 340. Some smart guy told me that's a second order polynomial. <laughs> if you graph it, if I fly in space again, I don't really come back. It goes <laughs> asymptotic almost. Maybe it's like a five and a half year mission. But I'm leaving the space station. I'm looking at this thing out the window, what I can see from the little window. And I'm thinking, you know, we built this thing a million pounds, the size of a football field or pitch, football pitch while flying around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour in a vacuum, in extremes of temperatures of plus and minus 270 degrees, built with this international partnership of 15 different countries, different cultures, different languages, different technical ways of doing things, put together by astronauts and cosmonauts in space in these difficult to work spacesuits, connecting these modules, some of which had never touched each other before on Earth. First time they ever met, was in space. This is the hardest thing we've ever done. Absolutely convinced of it. Harder than going to the moon. And if we can do this, we can do anything. If we want to go to Mars, we can go to Mars. If we want to cure cancer and put the resources behind it, we can cure cancer. If we want to fix our problems with the environment, challenges in my country, in the United States, which there are many, I think they are all solvable. Challenges you guys have in your industry, in your country here or wherever you may come from. I was absolutely inspired after spending a year in space that if we can dream it, we can do it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go, Kelly. Thank you.